Welcome to the conference and welcome to the Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center. We're located off campus in Spring Hill, Tennessee, and we're one of 10 research and education facilities within the University of Tennessee uh, Ag Research System. So our facility is 1,265 acres and we have a new initiative to develop infrastructure to house precision livestock technologies. And that's equipment that will actually gather real-time data, whether it be uh, body temperatures, uh, body weight, water consumption, things associated with nutrition, reproduction, and animal health. And we hope this can be extremely impactful, not only for the researchers collecting uh, hundreds and hundreds of pieces of data, uh, each and every day on the cattle as they visit uh, these new technologies, but also culminate in information that can be shared with our producers, not only in the state of Tennessee, but across the country and the world. The Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center is located off campus. We're approximately three hours from UTIA uh, in Knoxville. So one of the challenges that we have and, and very uh, adeptly overcome is to have a really good staff located at the Research and Education Centers located across our state. And I would like to just briefly introduce our Precision Livestock Agriculture and Farming Team. Uh, it begins with Wes Gillum. Uh, he is a research specialist and is in charge of the beef cattle herd management and research conducted here at this site in Spring Hill, Tennessee. And we've been recently uh, very fortunate to be able to, to acquire Claire Hunkler, uh, who has her master's uh, from the University of Tennessee in Knoxville in animal science. She actually heads our Tennessee Beef Heifer Development Program and will be the key lead in all of the precision livestock technology work that we do here at Spring Hill and really be the liaison with the researchers there in Knoxville and the work being conducted here. Directly behind me, we have a unit produced by Sealock Incorporated and it's something that we're extremely excited about. It's the green feed system, which actually measures uh, both atmospheric methane and, and uh, carbon dioxide and also the individual cows methane and carbon dioxide production and it's a system that actually works off uh, of a feed response. The cattle uh, go through a brief learning curve, uh, they step up to the system uh, and through identification through the radio frequency ID tag they're delivered a bait of feed and they go in there and they consume it, it takes about five to ten minutes and during that feeding period it's measuring the actual production of of methane and carbon dioxide. And it's a system that's very applicable across any uh, production uh, segment within the beef cattle industry. Currently behind me, you can see a set of, of spring calving cows. These calves are about a month, month and a half old uh, on their mamas. And these cattle are currently grazing uh, a winter annual. It's a ryegrass uh, wheat mixture. And that's one of the intriguing things about this system. We can see variations or hope to see variations in methane and carbon dioxide uh, production through these individual cows on different types of pasture. Uh, just two weeks ago, these cattle were strictly on no pasture at all and receiving dry hay and haylage. So we have different measurements there that have been collected and sent to Knoxville for, for database collection and, and investigation. And now we've moved this system into this greener, higher moisture forage uh, environment. But also we can utilize this system on different growth stages. Uh, it can be utilized through our heifer development program in Lewisburg or the heifers that are developed here in Spring Hill to see the variations that they go through through different growth patterns uh, of their life, uh, of, their, of their growth. One of the intriguing things about this green feed system and one thing that makes it so very applicable to the researchers and data collection is, is that it can be used in a real world environment that applies really to, to many of the farms located across the state, across the country and, and really worldwide. We can move this system into any pasture within our 1265 acres regardless of, of type of cow or type of pasture. Uh, and we are able to do that because you can see we have a solar panel that actually charges the system and allows for all the atmospheric data collection systems to work. We can see up here we're taking actual atmospheric measurements of carbon dioxide and methane uh, production. It takes temperature uh, on a real-time uh, basis. And another thing that, that the solar panel allows us to operate in this 30-some uh, acre pasture without electricity 
uh, is this feeding system. So when a cow enters uh, this area, it identifies her through her RFID tag, uh, and it drops a beta feed in there, and she'll go into this area and start consuming that feed, and it takes her uh, uh, production uh, of the two gases that we spoke about just a little bit earlier uh, in every other cow uh, throughout this system. Another thing that it has, it has a cellular modem that actually transmits that information to, to our computers here on site, but also to Dr. Rowan's uh, office uh, in Knoxville. Uh, and this is a system that, that uh, Dr. Troy Rowan uh, is doing a tremendous amount of work with, not only from a methane and carbon dioxide production standpoint, but how that relates uh, to the genomics. Hi there, I'm Troy Rowan, and I'm an assistant professor in the Animal Science Department here at the University of Tennessee. And I'm going to talk a little bit about an ongoing research project that my group has at the Middle Tennessee Research Center, focused on using some of these precision tools to help identify and breed more efficient forage-based cows. So I'm a geneticist, so I'm interested in PLF in a couple of different ways. So the first is how can I use PLF to measure novel phenotypes that allow us to do genetic selection for economically relevant traits better? But the other thing is also, can we use genomics to help manage animals in a precision fashion? And this project tries to blend these two things together with this overarching goal of improving cow efficiency on forage. So measuring forage-based feed efficiency has been a really, really tough one to crack historically. Um, it's not as easy as putting feed in front of an animal in a bunk and watching it disappear. And we also layer on not just it's hard to measure how much a cow eats on a forage-based diet, but also how does she function within the environment that we're asking her to, to go out and perform in. And so we're trying to complete the picture a little bit and not just focus on the metabolism differences that exist between cows. So um, a high metabolism cow that needs more to eat versus a low metabolism one, uh, but also this behavioral aspect of, of grazing behavior, how some cows are able to, to go out and forage differently than others, while also factoring in all of the different moving pieces that have to do with the environment, particularly pertaining to forage quality. So the project that has just recently been funded in my group is focused on using phenomics, so trying to measure as much on these single individual animals as we possibly can. So this includes, includes real-time phenotyping using C-Lock technologies, some activity sensor data trying to get a handle on how these cattle are moving around, how their bodies are changing from a temperature standpoint, as well as all of these molecular phenotypes. So gene expression, metabolite abundance in, in the genotypes of these individuals themselves, give us sort of a holistic picture of the biology that's possibly underlying cow efficiency. So the workhorse, of course, is this green feed pasture system that Kevin just talked about, allowing us to measure gas fluxes of these three important gases. Important on their own, there's inter-individual variation here, which is good as a geneticist. There's, there's something there for us to select on. But my interest beyond just seeing those individual greenhouse gas emissions on an individual animal basis is to combine them together and try and understand that animal's metabolism. So using some creative uh, indirect calorimetry that folks have, have worked out, we can use these gas fluxes to compare the heat production between animals on the green feed. And knowing that heat production accounts for a big part of residual feed intake in a feedlot setting, it also allows us to maybe get a handle on how well these cows are, are using the resources that they're out there consuming. So that's a little bit about the research that we're doing at Imtrek, and, and I am so excited to see all the stuff that Kevin has going on there in the coming years. The Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center is really in a state of flux right now, and we're so excited about that. It's giving us the opportunity to transition into what was a very uh, productive uh, uh, research and education facility to one that now is truly going to be state of the art. Uh, we just came from uh, Dr. Rowan's work with the green feed system with the cow-calf pairs uh, grazing uh, winter wheat and ryegrass mixture measuring the methane and carbon dioxide production and now we're transitioning this facility that you see behind me from a 24-3 acre paddock area where historically we've done uh, grazing trials for different types of, of grasses and forages and 
and on uh, steer development, stalker development, and heifer development. Now we're transitioning this facility into 12 six acre pastures that will house the Tennessee Bull Development Evaluation Program. That has been a very successful program since the 1970s and served our state's beef cattle producers extremely well uh, from the standpoint of genetic improvement, but also our cow-calf producers uh, from being able to come and purchase bulls that have the ability to increase the efficiency of their production in the feeder cattle that they produce. With this transition, uh, these uh, six acre paddocks will house uh, Sealock Incorporated units uh, that are, one is a smart scale system that takes real time body weight measurements. It will actually measure the water consumption. But one thing we're extremely excited about, uh, Dr. Rowan will house uh, feed nodes within these systems and these feed nodes will actually give us the opportunity to take real-time feed efficiency data uh, which with that combined uh, with the performance of the bulls and also the heifers that will go through this program can give us a tremendous amount of information on on the genomic packages uh, that we have across breeds and within breeds uh, through this system. Uh, so it's something that we're extremely excited about. It's a process that, that is in progress. And again, it will take about a year to get this transition made, but it will certainly be very impactful, not only for research, uh, but also our producers throughout the state of Tennessee. One of the exciting uh, portions of the transition that we have here at the Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center into precision livestock technology and real-time data collection is how can we adapt some of this new technology, be it cameras or microphones or, or, or weight gathering systems into current uh, infrastructure that we have. And behind me you'll see a standard livestock handling uh, uh, chute. Uh, it's, a, it's a chute that we use daily to collect body weights, to perform uh, actual uh, management practices such as vaccinations or, or deworming opportunities or, or addressing uh, health issues. So the cattle go through these systems very regularly. You can imagine here at the Research and Education Center through the different data collection that we do. So it only makes sense that we adapt uh, those technologies to these current uh, infrastructures. And so that allows us to really do some very interesting work with, with some different folks up in Knoxville. Uh, Becky, Becky Trout Frexel uh, and Dr. Hal Gann have an opportunity through a funded grant to develop a, a real-time uh, detection system uh, for ticks, ticks that, that find uh, a cow, uh, that find cattle to be an acceptable host. So as we are processing the cattle through this system, we'll be mounting cameras above the cattle, uh, uh, cameras beside the cattle on the system, and, and cameras under. So as these cattle go through the system, it's actually taking video footage and assessing the quantity or number of ticks uh, that are on that individual animal to hopefully help us to develop a real-time system that can be utilized in industry, be it through imports or exports or, or just on the farm or at livestock marketing facilities uh, so that we can determine and help from an animal health perspective uh, track uh, the population of ticks that can cause some negative uh, health impacts to the cattle, and not only in our state, but across across the nation. Hi, I'm Becky trout Frixell. I'm with the University of Tennessee in the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology, and I'm an associate professor really working on medical and veterinary entomology. Um, so what I do is I look at the things that nobody likes, mosquitoes, ticks, flies, and I try to find ways to help our producers and help our people um, reduce those bites and reduce the problems associated with them. And as a part of the precision, precision agriculture program, um, one of the things that we've been working on is improving our ability to detect, report, and respond um, to our ticks and flies on our um, beef cattle or cow calf operations in the state of Tennessee. So for many of you probably in the room, um, you've, and you've done some form of integrated pest management. And really a lot of these ideas come from the work of row crop um, entomologists um, who've been looking at different ways to monitor pests on their animals, 
um, specifically um, using remote sensing technology, uh, visual AI, computers, um, and more, and really kind of getting all of the data that's available to us, putting it together, and identifying best ways um, for producers to make decisions, and then working with producers to make kind of better decisions as well. And so that's really what I'm going to be trying to do too. And as a part of that, the first thing we need to do is develop um, better, um, user-approved, safer methods for detecting our different pests on, on cattle. Um, right now, to detect ticks on animals, an animal has to go into a chute, and somebody has to actually go over and visually touch the animal, or sorry, physically touch the animal. They have to put their hands on the head of the animal. They have to put their hands on the side of the animal and um, sometimes on the underside of the animal in between the legs. And as you can imagine, that would not be very safe um, for most people um, or, you know, most people are just, yeah, most people would not be able to do this um, and even look around at the tail and back of the animal. Um, other things that we do when it comes to looking at flies on animals, um, we, are all, we are already in the field taking images of animals and trying to count the individual flies um, on those animals. And to give you an idea of what can also happen um, is that we can actually, let me turn off the sound. We can look at these recordings of animals and look at the behaviors of the animal as well. So when we see here, we see tail switching, we see um, foot stomping, we see bunching where the animals are coming together, and we can physically see those flies, the reflective wings of the flies um, in these videos. So from there, we should be able to monitor um, and create records for what's happening on these animals. So moving forward, we have been quite successful in getting the project started. Um, we're still in the um, validating and working phases. Um, some of the things we've done with the University of Nebraska and USD ARS Mark is developing um, improved methods for detecting flies on cattle. And you can see here this dairy animal, this Jersey cow. Um, there were a lot of flies on this animal. Um, over here in the middle, we annotated the flies on the animal, and then the neural network was able to actually count and confirm that there were flies on the animal. If you're interested in this publication, um, there's a QR code you can scan and look at um, yourself. Most recently, we've been awarded a USDA NEPA CPPM project um, to detect ticks on cattle. And so it's the same idea. What we'll be doing is working with producers, working with our um, collaborators out at the Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center, um, having um, all of us take a bunch of different images of cattle. And hopefully what you can see here are these little black dots on the animal. And so those little black dots happen to be Asian longhorn ticks on the back end of this cow. And so if we can see that, then we know the computer program can see it as well. So again, it's using that idea, the visual AI technology to help us count and make it easier for us to record the number of ticks or even if there are ticks on an animal. And all of this really comes together in order to make to help producers make data-driven decisions. So once we have a better idea of how to monitor these pests on animals, we'll be able to create these economic thresholds um, from basically identifying different distributions, phenologies, the pests, the damage associated with them as well. And ultimately, again, creating these integrated pest management programs um, for our producers. And with that, I'm Becky trout Fixell again with the Department of Entomology and Plant Pathology. Thank you. Currently, I'm standing with um, Sealock Incorporated's Smart Scale system. We have several of these located throughout the Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center. And again, going back to being able to gather as much information as we can, this, this implement, as we've talked about before, captures uh, body weight information each time a cow comes to water. We also have the, the ability through flow meters to measure water consumption on the cattle as they drink, regardless of class, be it our stalker program, our heifer development program, our bull uh, test program, or our cow-calf operation. And this is actually being currently used uh, within a set of spring calving cows. And so this, this smart scale system is actually being utilized by Dr. Hal Gann to host or affix some of his equipment. And Dr. Gann, being in biosystems engineering, has some really unique and new technology that he is adapting and affixing to these PLF systems that we have. And above me, at the animal entrance, where the cattle will actually be standing while they're consuming or drinking water, there is a camera. And that camera actually measures the actual respiration rate of each individual that comes to drink. 
And so that can tell us a lot of information from is this animal getting sick and is its body temperature raised so it's breathing uh, uh, more rapidly or is his breathing or her breathing uh, slower. So he can develop models off of that uh, over time because each time uh, that animal comes to water three to four times a day, that information is collected. And also affixed to it through the wire coming down is actually a microphone system that actually captures the, the uh, respiration noises of that animal. So that can help us also from the standpoint of identifying some abnormalities or a baseline normal uh, for sounds of healthy cattle uh, while they're standing at the water uh, and consuming water. The anomaly detection for cattle respiration and drinking behaviors is a current project at Amtrak funded by USDA. The goal of the project is to use respiration and drinking behavior as indicators to detect the potential illness and welfare problems in animals, and then send producers early warnings. The sensing system combines camera and microphone and is installed on a C-Lock smart scale, which is a commercially available cattle weight tracking system. Animals will put their front feet on a scale while drinking from a ball waterer. Using the sea lock as a mounting location, our system will be able to capture each animal roughly two to four times a day. The main sensing components of the system include an ultrasonic sensor, a RGB camera, and a microphone. The ultrasonic sensor is used to trigger the audio and video recording. When an animal is present, the sensor detects it and starts the data collection. The duration of the data varies depending on how long the animal stays at the sea lock. The microphone is used for sound analysis. We installed a directional microphone pointing towards the ball waterer. The microphone was also selected to have minimal built-in filters so that we could record all possible frequencies and then decide what filters to use ourselves. Our goal is to use the microphone to record the sound of ball pressing, drinking, and breathing. We used a low-cost RGB camera with a 120-degree field of view, and it records at 30 frames per second. The recorded video, besides being used for computer vision development, can also be used as ground truths for the audio data. The main usage of the camera is to develop computer vision algorithms to detect drinking behavior and respiration rate. We focus on the key points at the head and neck area to analyze drinking durations of each animal and the flank area to track the animal's respiration rate while drinking or not drinking. Our preliminary results have been presented at the second USPLF conference. If you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me. Thank you. We're currently standing at the University of Tennessee Bull Evaluation Program uh, barn and feeding research barn. And we've got within this system some of the first precision livestock technology units uh, that we started with here uh, at MTREC. And this is a smart scale system. And it actually takes real time body weights each time the animals go to uh, a, a drinking event or to take a drink of water, it measures their body weight. We also have the water or flow meters located within uh, the water units themselves. And Dr. Kyle McLean has been utilizing this for the last two years and has really compiled a very interesting set of data that, that he's, he's starting to analyze now. It, it offers a lot of promise uh, in early detection for bovine respiratory disease. You know, if we see cattle that that uh, are not as active coming to uh, the drinker, it identifies that for us. So we know to go out and check that bull or that steer, whether it be uh, in our bull evaluation program or our stalker program and determine why has it slowed down coming to uh, the drinker? Or are they visiting the drinker at a, a more frequent uh, uh, 
uh, timing during the day. Another thing that really helps us to do is to really monitor relative uh, weight gain uh, within that pen. Do we see bulls that have, have been uh, increasing uh, in average daily gain and then all of a sudden they start dropping off. Well, they may be having health issues or some type of digestive uh, disorder that needs to be addressed. This, this is some systems uh, that are really going to be impactful in collecting a lot of data that we've never been able to do in the, in the history of, of agricultural research. It's going to, to really, to, to give us some information that's going to be impactful for our producers, for our researchers, um, and not only from, uh, from actual protein production, but from an animal health standpoint uh, as well. Hello, my name is Kyle McLean. I'm an assistant professor here at the University of Tennessee with a research appointment focusing on ruminant reproductive physiology and reproductive efficiency in beef cattle. I'd like to take a little bit of time today to share with you some work we're doing with some smart scales and the impacts of, of PLF technology on reproductive efficiency and, and development of beef bulls. Uh, the data I'm gonna share with you today is looking into water intake and water behavior and the potential usage of it for reproductive efficiency purposes. To do this um, work, we've been utilizing some smart scale technology associated over some waters for at the, the bull test at the Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center. And we're looking at not only what that data looks like as far as real time or close to real time, average daily game and growth traits, but also in, uh, water behavior and water intake. So interestingly enough, with some preliminary analysis of this data, we do see some differences between bulls and the number of visits uh, on any given day, as well as some differences across that feeding period on associated with the dates with a tendency for a, a body weight covariate. It's really uh, comforting to find the, the difference in dates and the, in the body weight because the data is really well established that size of an animal will impact water intake as well as environment. And so the, the impacts of dates you can see on this graph, the first three bars were, were days in October when here in Tennessee, it's still a little bit warmer. You would expect them to take more trips to the water tank and in, in, have a higher level of water intake in general. Whereas those last three bars on the graph there on the right were in December when the weather is cooler, intake of water is what expected to be a little bit lower. And so what this data is starting to kind of show us is there are some real differences in intake, not only average time, but total time. And we see a strong significance of average time between these five bulls of this preliminary data set that really may indicate that we can use this as a selection tool or utilize it to start understanding some differences between water usage and water requirements between bulls that might allow us to do some, some more digging into the reproductive impacts of the bulls based on some of the water behavior. And to kind of further exemplify this, we did some quick correlation analyses to, to sh show that we do have time spent at the water and average time at the water impacting average daily gain in a negative way or being correlated with a, a lower average daily gain, which would make sense when you have animals that are at the water tank, they're not spending time at the feed bunk, so they're not growing and developing like you want them to. But interestingly enough, we see a positive correlation with time and average time at the water tank being associated with an increase in tail defects. And so we'd really like to, to continue diving down that route because that shows some real impacts on the reproductive side of things that could be utilized in either in development or even in a production scenario with these scales and water behavior monitoring out in a pasture scenario that you wouldn't necessarily get in a dry lot. So as we continue to dive through this, we're wanting to not only continue to establish behaviors in time at the water, but validate these flow meters that we're using on these smart scales to get actual water intake, whether that be in a water requirement or just associating that with growth, but really getting a, a hard value um, associated with this in a relatively real time scenario, and then take that and establish the impacts of drinking behavior and water intake on reproductive function. Really expand upon that correlation that we saw with the tail defects to understand what this might mean for reproductive capabilities in these developing bulls. And as well establish that feed efficiency and growth are heritable, we want to know is water. The commodity and the limited commodity of water 
is a is a big impact in the the beef industry and so we want to know is it something we can use as a selection tool whether that be for requirements or maintenance or in the more expanded upon and reproductive function and offspring per function and um, maintenance of those that animal and the, that animal's offspring thanks for taking the time to listen to me today if you've got any questions my email is here at the bottom i'd be happy to discuss this data with you in the future thank you my name is claire honkler and i am the coordinator for the tennessee beef heifer development center and i am also the li liaison between the precision livestock farming technologies that we're having put in place and with researchers in knoxville so by, behind me, you'll see the SmartFeed Pro. It is a new PLF technology that we are putting in place that is on a more pasture-based um, technology where cattle will come into this um, and they will have an RFID tag that will be in their ear that this can sense off of that. And it actually is um, great because you can do multiple applications with this one technology of having different feed rations, up to four in this um, bin behind me and then you can alter those feed rations to be able to do um, further research on these animals, whether it be uh, mainly with stalker research, um, can also be applicable to um, cow-calf and bull selection as well. Um, but with this, what is great is that it can help um, identify cattle that are going off feed um, whenever they get sick, especially with uh, bovine respiratory disease or BRD with stalker cattle research. Um, you can identify those animals and see um, their health conditions and see if they are um, in fact have BRD. And this is some exciting research that we have here at UT where we're doing more of these precision um, livestock technologies and based off of individual animals and not animals as a whole. So you can put 60 animals on this uh, behind me, but you can do individual animal um, t information off of this and data collection off of this unit. Um, what's also great is that we're setting groundwork a lot with BRD um, in stalker cattle research. We're able to um, look at these animals on more individual based system and being able to have research put out there for producers to help them um, buy, sell, and trade these animals. Behind me you'll see uh, some of the Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center's replacement heifers developed here. Uh, and in large part, uh, the reproductive team of Dr. Lynette Edwards uh, played a major role in the quality uh, and, and really the quantity of the heifers that we have standing behind us. And, and as, as you know, uh, reproduction is probably the most economically important aspect of beef cattle production uh, uh, in the world. Um, and so Dr. Edwards' team is starting to utilize precision livestock technology that is actually attached to each uh, individual animal. And, and some of the groundbreaking work that she is doing is identifying increase in body temperature during reproductive events. Uh, so how rapidly that body temperature increases, uh, how quickly that body temperature decreases, and how it's associated uh, with conception rate during timed artificial insemination events, and even further down the road, uh, how those animals are able to maintain that pregnancy uh, and be efficient. Uh, so she's really identified a lot of very unique and very impactful information, and we're very proud to be able to do a lot of the research with her reproductive team here. Uh, and we, we have an ongoing research project that started two years ago. We continue it this year uh, and will follow up in the future. Uh, so again, behind us, you'll see this set of replacement heifers that, that can also uh, help us with, with nutritional information, development information, with all the different pieces of livestock uh, precision uh, equipment that we have, be it the smart scale systems um, or, or the feed units that we've looked at. One of the things that I'm most excited about uh, the transformation here at the Middle Tennessee Research and Education Center is the opportunity to actually put in new infrastructure that's going to be very impactful, but also is going to be very unique uh, to academia. So where we're standing now is the home of the new smart pasture system. So we're developing 15 three acre pastures here that will be outfitted with electricity and fiber optic cable. And each of these pastures will house a heavy use area or a fence line feeding system that will have a, as you can see behind me, the, the silver unit uh, that is a feed node 
and also a smart scale system and also some technology related to the green feed system that we saw earlier where we can do some really intensive research from a stalker development program but also from a reproductive program in developing replacement heifers. We pile all that onto and to be very efficient with the research that we do we really want to stack research opportunities so we're going to be developing different forages throughout this 15 uh, three acre paddock system as well and combining even some robotic systems from biosystems engineering uh, and Dr. Hal Gann's work. Uh, so we're really excited about this. Uh, the Wayman Hickman uh, Precision Technology Unit uh, is, is one of the, the, the things that we're going to be calling this and it makes this system possible along with uh, many of the, the grants that our researchers are working with. So we're really excited about this transition and this is really going to be a keystone uh, to really offer our producers but also industry and other academic institutions to actually come and visualize the work being done here.